Amanda Eyre Ward is the New York Times bestselling author of seven novels, including The Jet Setters, Iris's book club, Hello Sunshine Pick. She lives in Austin, Texas with her family. And Emma Brody has worked in publishing for a decade, most recently as an executive editor at Little Brown's Voracious Imprint. She graduated from the Johns Hopkins University's Writing Seminars Program and is a longtime contributor to HuffPost and a faculty member at Catapult. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and their dog, Freddie Mercury. We loved Songs and Ursa Major so much at Archie Julia that it's actually a staff pick at the bookstore. Terry had the following to say, in the early days before the music industry became the behemoth that it is today, one woman stands against the male-dominated industry, com compromising nothing to perform her music the way it was meant to be, except her heart. Inspired by the true life love affair between James Taylor and Joni Mitchell, this is a mesmerizing ride down memory lane for all of us who lived and loved the music of the 70s. You'll find Jane Quinn to be as complex as the music she writes. Emma Rohde has written a hit for the top of the charts. So on that note, I am going to let Amanda and Emma take it away, and then I'll pop back on around 740, 745 for audience questions. So I hope you two have a great conversation, and I will see you all soon. Hi, Emma. Hi, Amanda. So excited to be here. Ooh, we're a split now. Love it. Feels uh, very sexy. Now I want to hold up your beautiful book so that anybody who has not ordered it will get to it. Stat. I did not know there was a Spotify playlist. Oh, yes. Yeah, they couldn't keep me away. I actually have like a public facing one and a private one. So you um, see the like cool, like public facing one. That's the one they link to. And then I have a secret one that's just for myself that I'll reveal when Carly Simon reveals who you're so vain is about. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait. I might have to bug you for that private one because <laughs> I am so in love with James Taylor and Joni Mitchell. I mean, his music, his music. I don't, you know, I've thought a lot about him over the years. I, like you, apparently are a boarding school girl from New England and we listen to a lot of James Taylor. So tell me how, I actually either had forgotten or didn't know that James Taylor and Joni Mitchell were a couple at one point. So can you set the stage for anyone who hasn't read the book yet? Tell us about the inspiration and how you got there. Sure. Okay. So basically this book is loosely based on the early relationship between James Taylor and Joni Mitchell, which you're not alone. No one seems to remember that they dated, which I think is because his marriage with Carly Simon was 10 years and it just kind of eclipsed the whole thing. And I also think, you know, they're, they're both monster successes, 50 year careers and they're icons and their, their mythology is so different from each other's that I just think there isn't like room for overlap between the two of them in most people's heads, but they did date. Uh, they met singing at the Newport Folk Festival together. J Joni was singing on the amateur stage, was not happy about it. And JT was there as a newcomer and she was meant to be singing like a solo and she forgot the lyrics and he stepped in and reminded her what they were. And then they fell in love and they dated for a year, um, a crucial year. And he wrote, you can close your eyes about Joni, which that was actually when I learned that that was the fact that kind of cracked this idea for the book open because I know that song. Everyone knows that song. I've seen him sing that song with so many people. And I just kind of assumed he'd written it for Carly. And the idea that it actually had this whole other story that had been eclipsed and like completely lost to most people's recollections was so fascinating to me. Um, and then it turned out that she had also written Blue about him, like Blue is her nickname for him. Um, and so this mutual musehood was just like the best thing to me. And from there, fictional characters, like my characters, Jane Quinn and Jesse Reed, they're very different in many ways. I think their stage personas are super similar, but other than that, like they're personal psychological makeup, very different. Um, they kind of started to take shape and it was just a blast to write this book, like following them, following their journey and just sort of taking these crumbs left over from these albums that I listened to obsessively. Uh, I just had, I just had the best time 
on it. I love that's such an interesting story because yeah, Joni Mitchell or I mean I Jane really comes across your fictional Jane as such a fully realized character. It's so fascinating to watch her rocket to superstardom and then take a step back. And I was wondering, you know, in a crazy coincidence, I spoke with Paula McLean this week and she gave you this blurb, let me just say. (laughs) <laughs> that, that Songs in Ursa Major is sparklingly original, a drenching, delicious, and impressive debut. That is a great blur. Um, and I asked Paula because I had actually tried to write a book once about Martha Gellhorn. And Martha Gellhorn had kept such a comprehensive diary of her own life that I couldn't do it. And so I said, Paula, how did you write a book inspired by a real person? And she said, it's the space between her diaries and who she presented herself as, and then what I saw. So it was like that space. Does that make any sense to you? Or how did you envision Jane? Totally. Um, I mean, I think I knew going in that there were going to be some really key differences between Jane and Joni. Like Joni, like, essentially thinks of herself as like Athena coming fully hewn from Zeus's head like she had polio when she was nine and taught herself all her music she like doesn't recognize her parents as having taken care of her like whereas my character (laughs) comes from this very nurturing family of women and she is a youngest and is very cared for um so I knew going into it that there were going to be there was there was immediately a separation before I even started writing the book between Jane and Joni what I thought was really interesting though, and what I started to sort of like delve into the crevice that you're talking about was listening to Blue and thinking about what I knew about the relationship between her and JT and what was published about them at the time, you know, which is super cursory and and they just had a different level of star access because obviously it could all be very curated. Like they didn't have social media. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm not telling you that, you know that, but it's like, they couldn't actually like cover people the way they can now. So it was possible to put out an image in that way, in a way that it's not anymore. Um, and then also just kind of reading between the lines of the lyrics, like obviously they've come back to being friends. Like they're publicly very supportive of each other now. And there was a time period where like he wouldn't pick up the phone when she called and actually in the album that comes after Ursa Major uh, for the ro- for the for the roses, I was about to say for the horses. No, yeah. for the roses. Um, there's a song where she's like, you won't pick up when I call like it's it's fascinating to see how it, it trickled down even beyond that. Um, and I think just because there was so little left over about the relationship, like he he released an audio book. Um, break shot it was like right before the pandemic and it's covering the first 22 years of his life like right up to the release of sweet baby james so he goes into his family he goes into like some of his own backstory and then he does mention blue and he quotes the lyrics to blue but just sort of says how and then he talks about you can close your eyes and how you know the meaning has changed as he sung it with carly and then with kim his current wife i love kim by the way um and just like how it's continued to go. So it was sort of like a weird nod to her, but he still didn't say anything explicit about the relationship. So listening to the lyrics, like listening to all I want, like listening to like, cause Joni is very confessional and she really gets specific about certain dynamics. You almost can tell what actually happened between the two of them just by knowing who it's about and like kind of parsing together like certain things like but it was a detective story, like figuring out like, oh, this flight tonight, he was actually filming a movie at that point. And when she's talking about Vegas, she's talking about coming back from that. And I think there was a little bit of like actual like forensic fact finding, but the real meat was figuring out like, how would they have longed for each other? Like they, they were in like mutually enclosed circles. And like part of what you're kind of talking about goes into this idea of like, Joni was going through what we all kind of go through now in terms of having to watch one of her exes visibly move on. Like Mm. no one else had to deal with that because no one else had to see pictures of the people they broke up with or had to hear from them. Whereas only a celebrity in 1971 would have had to watch it. Whereas now we all have to watch it. So I think like, you know, Blue just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Joni's like astounded that people love it. I'm like, because you were so far ahead of your time. Like everyone relates to this now because everyone's their own little celebrity. But like when she wrote that album, like there were songs on it where people like critics wrote 
that little green passeth all understanding. Like they actually wrote that about her song. And like, wow. it's so cool to watch it, like just continue to, to roll, but also to take meaning for people who can relate to it more. Sorry, that was a big, long, jumbly answer. I'm just really excited to talk to you. <laughs> I, just love, I love how you're saying, and it's so true, if there were a real um, moving, important relationship as the one you fictionally imagined in the book, there wouldn't be that much conversation because of course they wouldn't answer the phone. They wouldn't talk about it all the time. And so I love that, that it was like a mystery story you know, to find out what was at the heart of it. That's so incredible. It must have been weird when you were writing this book and then this memoir came out or that audio book, whatever. I was, was so excited. Well, so I'd finished the book by that point. I oh think it would have been really threatening if it had happened while I was writing it because by that point I was really like inventing most of this stuff and to know it, I think it would have interfered. Like I did... I listened to a ton of JT music and I knew I read like his Wikipedia, but I did not get deep into researching him because I felt like I could figure out enough about Jesse. Um, I didn't want to like get too far into him. Whereas like I read everything I could about Joni Mitchell. Like I wanted to understand her motivation because she's, she is like one of the things that I think, you know, does. Yeah. Well, and, and the way she does stick with herself, like, in this way that's very her and very like groundbreaking for the time. And I think one of the things with the book is like, you know, you're rooting for them to get together and I want them to get together and Jane will not sacrifice her album. And like, I'm still hearing new anecdotes about Joni to this day where like, like David Yaffe tweeted recently that jo Joni could have had both sides now on her debut album but didn't put this like monster hit on her debut album because it didn't fit with the concept it's like that level of integrity so I wanted to get into that a bit um and I think that's a characteristic that she and Jane definitely share yeah and I love that about the Jane character and how she recognizes well I won't I won't have any spoilers but I was gonna say yeah, I mean, what she gave up to, to maintain her integrity. Um, okay, so I have a question that I, I want to ask you a lot of questions, and it's already 618. But <laughs> I was hoping you could read, we have time, um, a little bit. Your writing is so beautiful. And one of the things that struck me consistently, because I know very little about music other than I love it, is how, and, and I didn't know you had written, I had sort of in some of my research saw that you had written some songs with your brother, but are you, you're a songwriter, obviously. No, your brother wrote them? So I wrote lyrics for the book, like that was part of the project, yeah. but I, I'm and not like a songwriter at all. Like, I, I guess I am now if, in a sense, but I, like it was just experimental for this. And my brother is a musician and he, basically took the lyrics that I had and put different melodies with them. So Wallflower, which we pay, played earlier, is one of his. Like he, he, I sent that to him and he sent me back like a guitar melody. Like that's a very like multi-layered arrangement. But, like, like Billie Eilish. Eilish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's my Phineas. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's so incredible to hear. Uh, well, let me just ask you quickly, though, as a side note, how the hell did you do the lyrics? How did, you, <laughs> did you know, like, okay, did you put in the manuscript, like, now I need to write a lyric about heroin? Or were you just kind of like, was it separate? Was it at the same time? How did you do that? I love this question. And I have a very specific answer for you. Right. So I like first draft, I was like, I'm not going to stop for anything. And so when, when I, I knew I wanted to have these like fun offhanded references to the songs. So I would just be like, Oh, like if a character's talking about Jane's like, Oh, I love this lyric that she wrote, like lyric X, lyric Y. And I would literally write lyric X and lyric Y and I then come back. And then basically like between first and second draft of the book, yeah. um, I put it down for like six weeks or so. I got married in that time. And Congratulations. Thank you so much. You know, went right into a pandemic. So uh, we're still still married <laughs> almost two years later. But basically wow. during that time, I wasn't letting myself look at the book. And I, I, I made an inventory of all the places where I'd left holes. Cause it's not just Jane. It's like Jane's band album, Jesse has songs, Loretta, like Morgan, Lacey, obviously Tommy Patton. Like there are a lot of different, there are like 30 songs that needed to happen. So 
it was one of those things where I think the volume of it like tricked me into just going for it yeah. because like Ursa Major I wrote like 10 times like that's the title song of the album of the book like I needed to make sure that like had everything and I went into it knowing <clears throat> the basic references but everything else was like well I know what happens in the book I know what this needs to represent for them and then it was just sort of like give it your best shot because so uh, you have that in your in your giant document that you were like, okay, after the wedding, I will, when I'm honeymooning in a pandemic, did you have like page 32, something about love, page 35, fun spring fling-esque kind of, you know, like, or did, was it like that? Was it, it was, a, so I knew. Document? This is so cool. It was a Google doc. Okay. Um, basically I did, I knew like, I worked backwards from Ursa Major. So I knew Ursa Major is going to be 10 songs. I knew like, X song would be like this part of her life. And then basically afterwards I went back and saw which one they should be referring to. Cause part of it is like the first half of the book. Like I love, like we're talking about this forensic like process I went through, like uncovering Joni's secret love affair, whatever, like that's, that's open. But to me, it was secret. Um, I wanted to recreate that with Jane. So part of it is, you know, you write the whole book, then you come back and you're like, okay, like what pieces can I show up front that then can we can have that fun moment where we're like, oh, I get why she compares this to like mirrors in a bar because she has a job as a bartender. So it was both things. Like I'd go back and be like, oh, I really want to emphasize these mirrors because I now know that's a lyric later. But there were other times where I'd be like, okay, I have this song and be like, ooh, this would be a really perfect moment to work in like basically the same language, but slightly different. So that way, when it comes back, it can be like a lyric and people are like, oh my God, I remember when she observed that. I was there when she created it, which is like- And, they're, re and they're each reading each other's stuff. So you have, you know, Jesse being like, oh, that does sound like it's about me and she has a secret and oh, it's so complex and I love hearing how you do it. Thank you. Oh, my um, and so the question, the, the page I wanted you to read from is, oh, that's a different one that I didn't even tell you about, um, is 174. You have a short, um, there's many instances, obviously, when Jane is writing songs, but I'd love for you to read after she leaves the bar and when the songs start to come to her, because um, I love that section. So okay. it starts with her... When she fell asleep? Yes. And then should I go to like an No, no. It starts with as she walked home and it ends with I need a piano. All right. Okay. okay. You see where that is? Yes. I think I have enough upper body strength to hold the book for that couple paragraphs. <laughs> so if I start to sag, you know why. Um, and then I'll... we get to a singing section. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and you'll get to hear <laughs> me sing. No, I'm going to sing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 perfect perfect okay um as she walked home she thought about her album it now represented the entirety of her hope she was adrift on a raft and these songs forming around her were the constellations that would guide her onward when jane fell asleep that night she had three songs in her pocket the others floating out of reach like clouds in a nebula but while she slept the day's realizations catalyzed inside her mind speeding up reaction time and synthesizing material when she awoke, several stars had begun to form where before there had only been phosphorus and vapor. There were seven among them, new songs clustered together in a dense mass of sound and light. Jane's sense of abandonment had cracked her album wide open and the tracks she had been gently easing into existence were now bursting forth all at once. She didn't have time to indulge in self-pity or self-doubt. There was peril in this cacophony. If she didn't get this music out of her body, it would devour her. Her urgency gave her focus. As she tried to untangle the melodies from one another, her guitar became inadequate. I need a piano, she said to Elsie that night at dinner. So is that how, um, in your experience, or how did you access that way that songs come to Jane? I was probably mostly talking about my own process there, like that, that paragraph, that passage comes at the end of a sequence where basically Jane's between albums and she has suffered some disappointments and she's trying to like, you know, 
be even handed and nurture herself and take a very like morning pages approach to her work. And then she hears some, some news that completely knocks her off kilter. And I just felt like that was very true to life where, you know, we all approach our art, you know, trying to be consistent, trying to be, well, maybe not all of us, but many of us try to be business-like and try to like have a professional approach. But at the end of the day, like sometimes it takes like an emotional surge, whether it's jealousy or envy or disappointment, or just you hit a point where you're like, I have to like, excuse me, shit or get off the pot where it like, starts to chemically react and grow out of you to the point where you're no longer controlling it. And I think what Jane's experiencing in that moment is like, I don't want to call it inspiration. Like, I kind of feel like that's a dangerous word, but she's having this moment where the, the emotions that she's experiencing are speeding up the ideas that she was trying to just kind of like take as they come. And because of that, like, There are other things in the story where she, we've just had a lot about Jane trying to like stay emotionally on an even keel. So part of what you're hearing in that passage is also her trying to like make sense of contradictory things in that way. Um, That was fascinating. (laughs) I love that. I've never um, written a singer and because I don't understand how it works, honestly. So it was so interesting to me. So another, um, process that I love hearing about is the relationship between an editor and an author and you were an editor which I didn't know I still am actually (laughs) oh you still are really at Little Brown yeah oh fantastic um that's sort of and living in Brooklyn with a cute dog that's kind of my alternal life that I wanted (laughs) tell you the (laughs) truth I didn't I never got there maybe someday um (laughs) do you have your dog by the way he, my husband took him out because okay, he's okay. being really sassy. Oh, he just came back in and his, his eyes are like this right now. <laughs> well, tell me, so being an editor who works on manuscripts, um, and I love your editor, and she just seems like a dream to work with. What was it like to have her, what sort of relationship did you have? What sort of comments did she have on your first draft? Talk, talk about that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. So I love my editor too. She's super brilliant. And when we first talked, she, she, I felt like she matched my enthusiasm for the project and that was really special. And her birthday is also 622, which is the date of Jane's album and the blue day. Like there was all this cool cosmic stuff. And she was basically like, I just want to do surgical things. So there were a few aspects to the story. Um, Like she had some cosmetic pieces like she Jane's band which is called the breakers in this book um was originally called harpoon which I thought was very clever I but now that. I can see that she kind of oh. saved me from myself with that one um <laughs> yeah exactly um and she you know in her way she wasn't like oh this is too on the nose she's just like I think this sounds too much like a 90s band and we like moved on from it and now I'm just so grateful um but yeah, we talked, there were a few, there are a few sort of like hidden things. Like one of the themes of the book is like things that are hidden in plain sight. And she helped me a lot in terms of, you know, figuring out the right amount to reveal in certain places and the right amount to, you know, conceal. Um, there's also a whole trajectory in the book where Jane, Jane's mother is a librarian um, and she disappeared. Like we learned that early in the book, she disappeared when Jane was nine and there's a whole theme in the book where they talk about, you know, Greek mythology. And I had a different thing there and my editor is responsible for switching that in. So there were lots of things where she like tweaked on like an exchange by exchange basis, but um, the overall structure was basically what it was when we submitted it. And then she had these things that just kind of like, like made it sing, like in my, I mean, in my opinion, like I think I thought her edits were so smart and I, it was one of those like real privileges because I felt like I was learning so much just from getting to work with her. So yeah, it was a wonderful. I feel process. the same way. It's such a gift to work with an editor who just, you know, understands things you don't understand. Yes. It's a dream. It's a dream. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of Greek mythology, I noted for some reason I just fold down pages when I'm reading and I know I get to talk to the author and then use this to find out what I want to find out (laughs) Um, but I love on 205 you have Simon talking with Jane and she is talking about the Greek myth of Ariadne and Theseus and he says how does that myth go no love without pain 
No love without sacrifice, says Jane. Do you see that as a theme in the book? I definitely do. I definitely do. Like and one so of the, what way does it work, do you think? I think that, you know, from the beginning, Jane's having to weigh competing responsibilities, like the responsibility to herself, the responsibility to her art, the responsibility to her family. And ultimately, like she can have some things, but she can't have others. And I think like she has very clear eyes about that. Like a lot of characters, and there are other characters in this book that kind of try to have it all at the same time. And what's unique about Jane is that she really faces that head on and makes those hard decisions for herself, even though it means suffering, um, which I mean, that's another like the, the suffering artist is definitely like a part of it. But I mean, I don't get the sense from Jane that she's doing it in order to suffer. Like, I think she wants to be happy and satisfied and she understands that she can't have everything. Yeah. Um, I love that about her. You know, she chooses herself and her art again and again, which is so inspiring. Um, and it's also really hard to write a love story between a fully realized person and an addict. And I assume since you were basing it on James Taylor, you knew from the start that he had to be an addict, but did you have a hard time with that? Cause he seems to kind of get better and worse and she wants to believe he's going to get better. And yeah, I mean, I think I was, I was playing around with like the differences between Jane and Morgan. Cause I feel like I've read the Morgan story a lot of times where it's Morgan, someone... for those who haven't read the book is the person that Jesse ends up with after Jane based yes. on Carly Simon yeah she and she's I love her um yeah she she's she's a really cool character but I feel like I've read a lot about like the opposite of Jane like the character where like I think I'm naturally more like this like more naturally codependent where you you see someone's potential and you want to like believe that all their problems can be overcome by your love and Jane because of her own mother and because of things in her past is unwilling to do that. Whereas Morgan totally falls into the trap. Um, and we get to sort of see how that plays out. I kind of forget what, what the question was. I'm just going to start rambling again. Oh no, <laughs> just how hard it is, I think, to create an addict character who's interesting, <laughs> you know? And so I think you did an incredible job of that because he's basically a blank space in a, in a lot of times. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, no, that's another reason why I didn't really like research too hard into 22 year old JT because I didn't want to know. Like I want to like, like 20 young people anyway, like I'm 32. I know that like, like everyone has young and young and young, but like, like most 22 year old guys are pretty unformed. And so we have that to start out with. And then Jesse also has like fame and chemical addictions. So I feel like part of what, you know, why we don't get Morgan's perspective until the end is because I wanted to suspend disbelief for us and also for Jane about what depths Jesse might have. Because I think he has hidden shallows rather than hidden depths. Yes, that's so right. it's, it's sort of like keeping that afloat. And he is a sweet man. And I, I do like love that he loves her so much and I think there are redeeming pieces to him but he's you know he does bad things too so yeah and it's it's kind of a I mean it really struck me those scenes that you get from Morgan's point of view later you know that he's just like asleep in the back room you know he's this incredibly talented charismatic person who's just nodding off all the time it it was it was a really great portrayal of an addict without the addiction sucking the air out of the novel I thought which can mm. happen so easily that sort of prurient interventionistic you know like oh let me see the I know. think my therapist would have preferred if I had done the other novel <laughs> but I I wanted to see like the road not taken like I wanted to see I wanted to see what Jane would do still loving him and still not quite believing that it's as bad as it is, but ultimately like not going down that road. Um, I know she had her line in the sand for sure. As soon as she knew how bad it was, she was out, which I mean, with a lot of regret and a lot of songs to write. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think she was like, you know, there she cycles through like that section you had me read, like that's like a very rapid like preview. And then she cycles through a whole grief arc. Like she's not done with him, but I think like, based on things you'll just have to read the novel to find out about yeah. she can't she just can't let herself go through it again if that makes sense 
yeah, of course. And it's amazing because most people do. <laughs> um, so tell me, what are you working on now? Oh my God. I mean, I'm sort of like, this is such a conceited, weird thing to say. I feel like I have a book hangover from my own book where like, I kind of like want to force myself to move on. And at the same time, I'm like, but I still love it and I can't. So any advice you have, like you are such an amazing writer. Like I would love to hear your advice on like figuring out the next thing. Cause there's also like, I think I'm intimidated as well. Cause like as an editor, I know like sophomore slump is like totally a thing that happens so I'm just trying to like find my courage in this moment I have a few ideas some days I'm like I have 10 ideas and then some days like you're never going to do this again so give me your wisdom Amanda oh my gosh I mean (laughs) my only thought that's kept me going well first of all I have three kids so to be away from them I have to pay for child care to be alone so I want to be alone (laughs) produce pages but I mean just die the best thing you can do is pick one of the ideas and dive in you know I mean George Saunders my favorite one of my favorite people and writers said it's like holding your hand over the burner to see which one is hot and I actually work with index cards oh that I finished a book so that's not filled with index cards but I'll just jot little person on a plane or you know Joni Mitchell or whatever and then set aside time and just go in and see which one is hot and where it takes me for a long time before I even figure out what it is um and just try to I just try to focus on the pleasure of the writing because then it doesn't matter how your books do You know, I've had huge successes and sad failures in terms of commercial success, but getting hung up on that is just leads to misery, you know, as you probably know from your authors, but the pleasure of getting to sink into that process that you read about, you know, letting the whatever magic it is wash over you is what it's all about. So, you know, and then no one can take that away from you. Oh, I love that. Such a good answer. Except maybe Abbott. I'm just kidding. Uh, I said, except maybe Greg Abbott. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, anyway, <laughs> let's not go there. Um, well, I know people are about to start asking questions, but um, I have one last question for you, which is, have you read anything great lately? Oh, my God. Um, I'm, Tough like, in a very weird, like, reading space at the moment, but I am very excited because... Sylvia Moreno Garcia's new book, Velvet is Night, came out yesterday. So that, like, I'm going on vacation next week. That's the first thing I'm going to pick up. I cannot wait. Um, and you I also just on a to- Kindle or in a hardcover or what? I'm a hardcover reader. Yeah, I like I like to hold the books. Total trophy hoarder. That's me. Um, I've been trying to do on the Kindle, like you know, um, your <laughs> editor, and you tried to send it to me. And if it has weird formatting, I'm like, to just send me the hardcover. I read in the bathtub or on the beach. <laughs> I wish on the beach. I haven't been to the beach in a while, but um, where are you headed on vacation? Just here. So yeah, we just came back to Connecticut from a stint. We've been sort of COVID nomads. So we were in upstate New York and now we're back in Connecticut. And this like tiny town I'm in has a lake. So I'm going to go be a lake person. I cannot wait. Yes. And what um, else are you bringing to read? Oh my God. Well, that's what I have so far. Although I saw one of my teachers and so she gave me Summer of 69 by Ellen Hildebrand, which I haven't oh, read yet. So good. She's so amazing, isn't she? I know. And then she gave me the firekeeper's daughter. So I've got like a little bit of a stack. It's supposed well, to be phenomenal. It's a fellow Reese pick. Reese pick, it's nuts. The one, it's called We Were Never There, I think. And it's two mm-hmm. backpackers in um, Chile. And things go horribly wrong and a lot of twists. It's a great beach read. Though the, I really want to talk about it with someone. So if you finish it, call me because I don't understand the ending. But my editor's reading it too. So I'm going to ask her. <laughs> she said it to me. <laughs> Well, good. Um, are we ready for other questions or shall I just keep on going? I don't know. So oh, we're, are, Abby? We're, yes, <laughs> it's me. I'm back. Um, so we're waiting on the Q&A to start filling up. So just as a reminder, everyone at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A feature. You can send all of your burning questions for Emma and Amanda there. Um, and so I'm going to let you two keep talking for a few more minutes and then I'll I'll pop back on and and check in at about 45. Okay, perfect. Well, Emma, I get to tell you my funny story, which is that when I was researching the jet setters, I took my two boys on a cruise in Europe back when that was a thing. 
right before that stopped being a thing. And at one point we were on a bus tour in Italy and people were talking about JT, JT, JT. And I like these, you know, young people that I thought I was the same age as. <laughs> I like hung over the seat, humiliating my children. Like, hey, hey guys. Yeah, I just love JT. Like, what's your favorite song? And they started naming songs and I didn't know any of them. And it soon occurred to me that they meant Justin Timberlake. <laughs> and I meant James Taylor. So, oops. <laughs> JP My publicist teases me about that all the time because he's JT to me forever. Oh. So I'm I'm with you. Okay, is- I have an idea for you though. Bonnie Raitt. <laughs> Love her. She's Love best. her. She Give got something sober. To talk about. She a- yeah, that could be good. She's probably had affairs with all sorts of people. Oh my God. I feel like she also is one of those people that ma- majestically keeps getting better looking with age. Like, She's just like that unicorn. I love her. Yeah, the other one I absolutely love is Linda Rodstad. Just oh, like, yeah. I would like die on a stake. Like a lot of Jane's sort of band stuff is very Linda. Like she started with the Stone Ponies and then went solo after. So it's like, there, there are lots of different people, but yeah. I so love how her. do you write? What's your schedule? Oh no, so you're working as an editor and writing. How do you do those, both of those things? Uh, it's a little bit or like, part of your brain, the editorial brain from like nine to three and then writing or how does that work? I mean, pre pandemic, I definitely did like introvert days, extrovert days where I'd have like yeah. all of my meetings on one day. Cause there's no way I was going to get anything like right. creatively productive done that day. And then I would try to like do introverted stuff later in the week. But, um, honestly, like it's, 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 I, I've, I'm not a parent, but I imagine it's something similar where you have, you, you want to get it all done. So you just have to get it done quicker. Yeah. And I think like, for me, I don't know, it's not, it's not terrible at all. Like I, I do illustrated nonfiction, first of all. So oh, I'm not yeah. doing heavy lifting anymore. Like I had, there was a time when I was doing like prescriptive self-help and those are hard edits because you're also being kind of a therapist for your writer in a way that you aren't necessarily on other books. And then I moved into packaging more when I moved over to Little Brown. So now I'm doing like exclusively these like super high design artist driven books. And often the manuscripts are like 25,000 words. So they're, you know, they're real edits, but it's not the same as doing an edit on a 90,000 word novel. So that piece is really nice. It works really nicely like with writing. And then as far as actual writing, like it, I, it's just hard. Like there's no, there's no secret for me. Like maybe, uh, maybe you have the secret. Wait, what's your secret? (laughs) I would say the same, you know, I'm my, I'm friends from graduate school with Andrew Sean Greer. I don't know if you've read less. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. He's amazing. And yes, and we were friends for, met, you know, we've been friends since grad school. And when we met for lunch a few years ago, we were saying that in grad school, we would always try to identify who was going to make it, like who was preordained or chosen or the best. And in the end, we kind of admitted it doesn't matter. It's who's going to work the hardest. <laughs> it's really not. I mean, I'm sure there are people who no matter how hard they work, it's never going to hit. I, but I think for the most part, it's just we write the most pages, we get back on the horse when people hate what we do, we fix it if there's something broken, you know, be endlessly curious about how to do it. Yes, I love that. I think I, that's, yeah, I had, I had like a whole chorus of people, like not friends, but like next tier down when I first like announced that I was doing this. Yeah, Yeah, like ancillary people, like third string. Um, (laughs) That's like 90% the people in my life I mean ideally right like <laughs> yes, I'm such an introvert that way I, I, I don't know if you saw me shuddering when you were saying oh, entire days you had to do extrovert oh <laughs> this is enough for me for like three yeah, days exactly. and Paula on the same week was a lot <laughs> she makes it really easy though <laughs> oh my gosh yes and so do you but oh, the best God. thing about having a family and I, you know we have a pretty big family is that you don't really ever have to go anywhere other than your house and you've got it all going on it's already a dinner party just having dinner together like I made my people I raised them and now they're like my best friends and it's that's fabulous. amazing it's pretty that's great. so ideal it's really great you know because you can be an introvert and basically be alone in your pajamas with four other people and to do oh. schnauzers <laughs> oh man you're making me like actually want to go for it maybe we'll have that conversation on a different night okay good, <laughs> good. but yeah it's it's always like I think 
just sitting down and like forcing yourself. That's absolutely true. I think so too. <laughs> Hi, Abby. Hi, Abby. Hello. <laughs> I have returned. Um, so I do, I actually, you know, read songs and nurse major, love songs and nurse so major, have a few questions to finish us out. And then again, last chance to the audience. If, if any questions have popped into your mind, anything you've got to ask Emma and Amanda, just pop them in the Q&A. So I would like to know, what part of this did you write first? Oh, that's a great question. Good that one. Is, I didn't ask. Such a good question. So I wrote this book sequentially. Um, I started with the fest and then I just went from there. Whoa. And I think, <laughs> I think part of it was that I was like doing this thing where we talked about that I'm an editor, right? So there's like this self-editing mechanism, which it took me like 15,000 words to stop constantly like nagging myself and the way that I did that was by basically saying like you know be your adverby self like write bad and just see what happens in the book like first you have to figure out what happens in the book and I knew there were certain things like I knew about Jesse's addiction like there are certain things with James Jane's family I knew but I didn't know the hows of any of it and so I was sort of like let's just write this to see what happens and hopefully like we can come back and fix it. And the book is in really short chapters, like 1500 to 2500 word chapters. So it individually incrementally, like that's not so bad if you have to go back and completely overhaul it, which like spoiler alert is what happened. <laughs> like I, part of tricking myself into, into doing this and thinking that it wasn't gonna be as hard as it was, was that I actually did my second draft in track changes on top of the first draft. So like, if you look at those pages, they're just red, but like the word Jane will be in black and white. <laughs> and like <laughs> Jesse will be in black and white. And I, I basically rewrote the entire thing, but told myself I was doing a line edit. Spoiler alert, that's not what a line edit is. Wow. Um, but I wrote it in order. And so I think that helped me like keep the momentum. It also helped because there are basically the beginning is, is pretty quick. Then there's one jump, then it's like sequential. Then there are more jumps that happen. And I wanted it to feel like an arc, even though there were these breaks in time. So that was sort of how I felt my way through that process. And it'll be interesting, like, you know, when I, when I, when I'm able to do it again, and maybe a few more times, like looking back on the process being like, oh, did I need to like, do it in that order? I don't know. But for this one, that was sort of how it happened. So good question. A little bit of brain trickery there with the track changes. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about tricking myself. So <laughs> well, here's a question from the audience that I just love because yeah, um, there are so many different characters in this book. And the cool thing is they're all so fleshed out and distinct. And it's like, you know, I almost want it if you want an idea, like spin-off stories about just basically everyone but um Deb wants to know what secondary favorite what character was your favorite to write oh my god okay I love so many of them so I guess I guess if Willie is a second character second tier character he'd probably be the one um Willie's Jane's A&R man and he I think of him as her foil like they have almost like the storybook arc that Jane and Jesse don't have and I I love him and he he was like the biggest surprise for me writing the book like when I first did the, that first fast draft he was just this like corporate fence-sitting yes man and by the time I came back and addressed like the sort of parallels between him and Jane and and just got more into his head I completely fell in love with him and I really love him um the other favorite is probably Hannibal thing. I really love him. Yeah. And he just like, you know, you're writing this angsty thing. You've got these characters, a lot of feelings. So when you come to Hannibal thing on your like seventh draft of the book, you're like, oh, you, you're so uncomplicated. I love you so much. And he's and just he very marries well. Morgan, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's like, that everyone such has a no crazy idea. surprise yeah. at the end. I was like, oh. <laughs> Sorry. But like, wouldn't they, you know, like, yes, wouldn't that be what happens? Yes. The epilogue is amazing because it's yes. just a jump into like, everyone's, don't worry, folks. I'm not spoiling anything, but let's just I say look, all of your questions answered and it is so satisfying. Anyway, just my side <laughs> <That's> note. <great. laughs> one person gave me a one-star and 
lit Amazon review because of the epilogue. They were like, I was going to give this five stars, but then you had that chapter. So this is very validating. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a piece of advice for you. Don't read your Amazon reviews. Of course I can quote all of mine, every single hour. <laughs> it's always destructive. Always. <laughs> okay. No, that's very good wisdom. No, um, one, no one will take that, including me, but we should. I've stopped with Goodreads. I've become more highbrow. So Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, on Amazon, you can see what else people review. So you can be like, oh, okay. One star. Well, how was that one pound bag of gummy bears? Oh, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's hilarious. oh boy. Um, here's another question. Um, so the Spotify playlist, as we discussed earlier, so awesome. I feel like it gives us a really deep insight into like your sort of yeah, process but I'm curious if you had other kind of influences from like other areas of life while you were working on it like movies or maybe other books I know you mentioned reading a lot about Joni so. I did I read a lot about Joni um that's such a great question I have like so many answers to this and it was it was basically like the kind of thing where I wrote the book and I was like this is all filler and then I went back and I was like actually I could probably just polish some of the stuff and that, that would be fine my mom's an opera singer. So I grew up, um, you oh, know, wow. in a house where music was like a language that I was exposed to. So that was very helpful just in terms of like having fluency with like basic terms. And like, there's a, like when I was in Simon's head, I really leaned on stuff I knew from my mom, like the term legato, thanks mom, um, that kind of thing. And then I was in a college acapella group. We were the comedy college acapella group. So I don't have a great voice, but I really loved it because it was, it, we just did so much and we, we toured and that was how I had the experience of like knowing about dynamics within a band. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it in 10 years when I wrote this book. And then I, I wrote it after I was like, how did I know that stuff? And I was like, oh, because you sound checked, like you did all that with your acapella group. So that, that, those like personal things were really influential. And like, I actually really love movies that are about fake bands. So I love music and lyrics. Like I love um, Uptown Girls, like the song uh, mm -hmm. Molly Smiles. I was thinking about that a lot when I was writing like Wallflower in that sequence. Um, and then also weirdly like classical music, like there's this Greek concerto that I absolutely love. Um, and I was like, when I was writing Jane's performance at the Grammys, I was thinking about that because it's just like this really dynamic piano thing. And at a certain point, like you're writing about the epicness of a folk piano song. Like actually, like I was thinking more about a classical piece when I was writing about the music there, even though like, you know, ultimately, hopefully the experience is like powerful and the readers just having their own thoughts about it. So I don't know. Um, yeah, lots of influences. Oh, that's really interesting. It's like you're thinking about one thing and you're writing about something else, but it, it totally Just works. like Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Come full circle. Um, here's another one. If you could have like one person, like your dream reader, read this book, who would it be? Would it be Joni? No, I wouldn't be Joni because I think it would, that would be like a Julie and Julia situation where like, I just, no, I know, no. Um, I, I hope she would read it and be very flattered by it, but I wouldn't, would. wouldn't expect that. Um, I guess, what a great question. I mean, Amanda Ward, so done. Um, and also just to quickly That's plug you guys, answer. if you haven't read The Jet Setters yet, you need to. It's so good. It's so good. I wish I could read it again on my vacation. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. No rules. Um, I will call and read it to you on your vacation. <laughs> That's great. I'll like set up all the voices. Like a blue, oh, the voices, Charlotte's voice. Oh my God. I'm so there for that. All right. Um, okay. Who would I, I'm, I'm like, I'm avoiding your question. Okay. Um, I guess like Lin-Manuel Miranda, he would be the person. Cause I just want to talk to him about his process and like, I feel like the way that he wrote Hamilton and the songs about writing in Hamilton, I just want to talk to him about Hurricane and like be like, me too, maybe, I think. So um, I think he'd be amazing. Or like maybe Mandy Moore because she's like my my icon. Like I love her. I've loved her forever. And she's this Joni super fan and also an act, like obviously an actress and singer. So I feel like we could have a chat about it, but 
Lynn manuel was the one that came to my head. Those are some good answers, I think. Amanda, who would you want to read songs in Ursa Major? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would like Joni Mitchell to read it. <laughs> I would, because I do think you did such a beautiful job of creating a strong character who's flawed and fascinating, and I bet she'd love it. But I have a quick question for you, because I see one of my incredible writing students, Susan, in the is in the event here and um my students write a novel over the course of the year and susan for for one has finished a fabulous novel that she's sending out now to agents to, and then hopefully someday an editor it is a sexy tale of older women um do you have any advice for writers who are in that stage who finished a book who are feeling overwhelmed by what's next um, yes, I do. I actually literally taught a class about this on Monday. I love the querying time period. I'm really passionate about this subject. So oh, you taught it at Catapult. Is that I right? did. Yes, I did. Awesome. Um, I'm going to tell my students about that. It's, oh my God, I, I love this subject. So I, I have a lot of thoughts, but basically, um, I will say like, there's totally hope, like quality rises to the top. People are looking for your book, I would say get a subscription to Publishers Marketplace. It's only $25 a month. And you can really drill down to create a submission list for the agents that you're looking to work with. Um, and then I have like a lot of specific thoughts on query letters themselves. I, I don't even know how to hone it down into just one. You've like accidentally tapped into like my secret, like morbid obsession, <laughs> which is querying. Um, but I you I'm give one to... or two tips because I always just say don't put a lot and just sort of try to interest as many editors as possible because when you the more you put the more chance people are gonna want to read it I think that's extremely good advice well, oh so I'm glad because I people didn't... are looking on their phones right that's oh, my dog Freddie yeah. by the way you might hear him barking in the background you want but, to meet the dog right uh, I know he's gotten so much like PR on this this chat <laughs> um yeah, people are reading on their phones. So I like my my approach is very much in in that vein. It's like you are trying to get someone's attention, make sure they know this isn't a form letter. So I usually have students like begin by just introducing the comps for their book and sort of tantalizing what? the agent. Exactly. So you oh would say gosh. a cross between X and Y because that just says like money and I'm business like and I want to work with you. Um, I always say I am inspired by my favorite authors, New York Times bestseller and somebody random. <laughs> exactly. Like that's, I, I have a similar thing of like, you want someone who's like the pie in the sky vision, right? Of like the best, most commercially successful version of your book, even if it's like a navel gazy literary thing written from the perspective of a cat in second person. Um, <laughs> And then you would have a second comp that's maybe more in line with your book, maybe another cat, Mabel Gazy book, um, to show that there is a market and that like this kind of thing has been done before, exactly. And then okay, usually like something specific about the agent. So say like mm -hmm. as the agent that represents this person, then I have like a whole, I have a whole five paragraph structure for this. But basically you would go into a pair, like a quick paragraph summarizing your book. That should be like, you know, what you would imagine in a bookstore, you can like do something a little more literary there, then it's your bio. And you talk about like four or five sentences about why you are the right person to write the book. It's not really your life story. It's just like why you should be. And it, like, that's the marketing and publicity part. So you say like, you're sort of thinking like farther into the process and thinking like, like what you'd say on Oprah. Yes. What you'd say on Oprah. Exactly. I'm Oprah, gonna say, that's still a thing. Totally. Oh my God. She's so, so powerful. Okay. Yeah. All of them, right? Like Reese, like they're so. Uh, the best like, part about Reese, you don't have to do, you don't have to do any of that. There's oh. no like B roll at your house or whatever. Oh my God. You, know, you don't go on a TV show. Oh. And yet she's the most powerful of them all. I think that's so fascinating. I love her a lot. She's, she's amazing. And we had oh the same God. mug the last time I was on a Zoom with her. Which oh my I God. got mine from Target. <laughs> you can never throw that away or wash it really like I hope you haven't like taken away the magic that's amazing that is great advice and I'm thank you because um my students ask a lot and I've been out of the querying business for 20 years so I'm glad to know I'll tell them to sign up for your class if you teach it again I 
I have a lot of feelings about it. So, because it's like most people can write, you could write a great book, but you can't write, it's like a cover letter. It's a specific thing. And after like working at a literary agency, when I was first starting out, I was just like, oh, people don't know. They don't know. Um, And you should know. It's not, it's not actually that hard to do. So. Right. Well, everyone, you just got like a free five minute class. If you're an aspiring writer, that was amazing. Susan says, thank you in the Q and A. Oh, way. good. Thanks, so, Susan. Yeah, Thanks for coming. Oh, doing? I, I feel like we could keep going just like for another hour. At least this has been so much fun. I'm so happy I had the chance to talk to you too, but unfortunately we have to start wrapping up. So here I must say, as a reminder to our audience, if you haven't already bought and read The Dang Thing, what are you doing? Songs and Earth and Major (laughs) is available in store and online, again, from RJ Julia, Wesley and RJ Julia, Bookhampton. And again, links are there for you in the chat. We do have a limited number of signed book plates as a special bonus. Amazon will not have those BG dubs, so get your orders in ASAP. And that's about it from me. So, I have to recommend reading this book and just constantly listening to Joni Mitchell and James Taylor. So read it and then listen to You Can Close Your Eyes 47 times as I did. It was such a <laughs> wonderful experience. It's such Aww. a great, it was like when I read Kevin Kwan and he put all the pictures of all these fabulous locales. So I just listened to it constantly. And my son and I shared the same Spotify playlist. So it'd be like Joni Mitchell, and then all of a sudden I'd get ASAP Rocky. And finally I was like, I need my own. I'm paying for the family. <laughs> so for, for your book, I had to get my own. And now I just downloaded that playlist. Oh, I hope you love it. Nice John Martin was my secret discovery. Yeah, he's amazing. Anyway, yes, thank you so much for having us. This oh, is so Carry fun. on. Oh, the first soul. All right. Thank All right. you. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Mm-hmm.